Well, welcome to the uh, Policymaker Forum. Uh, that was supposed to have been a video. I hope you all enjoyed it. Uh, but I ask that it just be cut off so we could, so we could go ahead and start. I'm uh, Senator Tom Harkin from the United States. I have the privilege and honor of chairing this panel discussion today. Uh, the Policymaker Forum, uh, where people will discuss uh, some new developments in domestic or international agendas, uh, new types of legislation, uh, new types of uh, plans, uh, and maybe also some emerging challenges uh, that will, again, spark your imagination to ask questions and get involved in a discussion. We have about eight or nine presenters. Uh, we've asked each to present maybe eight to ten minutes, so we'll take an hour of our two hours for the presentations. Uh, we will then open it up for questions and a discussion after that. So if one of the presenters then um, sparks something in your mind that you want to ask a question about, please jot it down or remember it and then ask it during the open <coughs> session, uh, which will be about an hour from now and we'll have a whole hour for, for that. So again, we have a distinguished panel. Uh, I, uh, in terms of just kicking it off, I, I would just say that in terms of new legislation uh, in the United States, uh, we have a new piece of legislation that focuses on youth transition. In other words, getting young people who are in school, who, un who are under an education program for kids with disabilities, especially intellectual, uh, or developmental disabilities to get them into summer jobs, after school jobs, um, job coaching, job shadowing, so that they can be, pe be prepared to enter the workforce when their school is done. We've never had that before. In the United States, when a young person uh, finished their schooling uh, in, in a sort of special education regime, uh, many times they were funneled into a, a job that was a dead-end job, very low sub-minimum wage with no chance for advancement because they never had any work experiences. Now that can no longer happen. They have to have transition work so they can discover what they like to do and what they might be capable of doing before they are put out into the workplace. So that's just a new development in, in legislation that we have developed that in the United States to help transition youth from education uh, to meaningful, competitive, integrated employment. So that's my presentation, very short, uh, to start people thinking about uh, new approaches, uh, new challenges. Uh, I'm sure there are many that I haven't thought of uh, by now. So I will start and we will go down the line and our first presenter will be Mr. Max Rubish, uh, born in 1955 in Innsbruck. He's a doctor of law. Uh, he, since 1990, he is the head of the department at the Federal <coughs> Ministry of Labor, Social Affairs, Health and Consumer Protection. He is responsible for Austrian disability law and disability policy and European and international issues in disability policy. His department is the Austrian focal point of the CRPD, the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. Uh, since 1997, he's a member of the Disability High Level Group of the European Union, and also he is a lecturer at Vienna University. And uh, we welcome Max Rubisch, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much, and good afternoon. I want to tell you um, something about our national action plans to uh, implement the CRPD in Austria, uh, the old one and uh, the coming one. Uh, first, um, some remarks about Austria. Austria is a federal state. Uh, that means that the responsibilities for disability policy are divided between the federal level and the regional level. So we uh, have uh, several focal points. So the next slide, please. 
can I? Mm -hmm. uh, that, that means that, oh, thank you. <laughs> No action. Oh. Ah. Uh. Yeah, that's right. So that means that we have um, one focal point at federal level for implementing the CRPD in my ministry. And we have at regional level, uh, nine regional, the nine regional governments have their own focal points. And for the coordination, of course, this is very important in such a system, the coordination between the federal and the regional level. Our ministry is responsible and also uses for that um, some uh, boards, the Disability Advisory Board at the first place. And we also have several monitoring mechanisms. At federal level, we have an independent federal monitoring committee. And at regional level, um, every regional government, uh, every region has his own monitoring committee. So um, we made a national action plan in the years 2011-12. And uh, our work was to uh, start with a great work forum with all the actors to identify the main issues uh, for an action plan. Then we sent out a template and all the stakeholders gave contributions to that. And we in the ministry made the draft of this action plan. Then we sent it out and we invited for a second work forum all the stakeholders of course, disability organizations, also federal ministries, uh, regional governments. And in this second work forum, we discussed the draft. We got a lot of written comments. And then we uh, made the final draft of the action plan within the ministry. Uh, in, in, and in this stage, at this stage, uh, we had no more participation. But but we finished it by ourselves. Then there were political negotiations between the different ministries, and then the federal government adopted uh, the plan in July 2012. Uh, some words to the implementation of this plan. The plan contains 250 measures in all areas of life, and by the end of 2017, we can say that about 65% of them are implemented, 31% are in preparation or uh, on the way to, to be implemented, and in 4% of the measures there is no action until now. What is important that we have uh, started in 2012 an accompanying group, uh, uh, so-called consulting board in the ministry, to accompany the implementation. Uh, and there we have in this group all federal ministries, we have all the regional governments, uh, the disabled people's organizations, and also monitoring committee, the disability ombudsman, ombudsman board, the social partners, and uh, universities. So all in all, it's a board of 46 persons, which meets twice, two or three times a year. And this is very helpful for us because we have with this board, we have a very good network, not only for implementing the action plan, but for implementing the CRPD and for all disability issues. So the fact, uh, that, <clears throat> the fact that we have a national action plan was very much appreciated in Geneva by the Disability Rights Committee. But we have got uh, a lot of criticism also from the disability community. Uh, the main points were that the participation was not enough. It was too much driven by the, by the government, by the administration. Then uh, that the mainstreaming was not realized. It was, it was too much driven by our ministry, Ministry of Social Affairs. Then one critical point was also that 
the regional, the regional governments, they did not participate in the plan. So it was an action plan only for the federal government. That means that important areas for disability policy uh, were missing in the plan. And also <clears throat> there was criticism that the indicators are not very good and uh, not, as, not enough indicators and uh, the budgetary information is missing. So what does, what does every measure cost? So now in the program of the Austrian government, now it's, it says uh, alignment of the Austrian law with CRPD, information campaigns and evaluation and follow up of the national action plan for the time period 21 to 30. So that means that now we are uh, preparing an evaluation of this first action plan. Uh, there will be interviews with the stakeholders how they, uh, how they judge the process of drafting, the structure of the plan, if it is coherent with the CRPD, if the goals and indi indicators and the measures are in a coherent system, and what are the outcome of this plan for different areas of life and for different groups of disabilities. So um, as a result of this evaluation, there should be recommendations for the next action plan. And that's what we're preparing now at the moment. And we try to make some difference. We try to mainstream the disability issue, not to make it all everything in our ministry, but to create all in all, 25 teams in the different uh, ministries and in uh, the regional governments, and all the teams have to ensure the participation of the stakeholders in the process when drafting their contributions. And we invite the regional governments to participate, so we want to make uh, a common action plan, federal and regional level, and concerning the indicators, we try to find more indicators, better indicators. We try to find more budgetary information, if this is possible. And of course, the results of the evaluation, <coughs> uh, we will have them by the end of this year, and they will be taken into account in the process of drafting the new action plan. And then when we have the contributions, we will coordinate it and we'll give feedback to, the, to all the stakeholders before, uh, before going into the political negotiations. Uh, and our aim is that uh, the government will adopt uh, the plan uh, by the end of 2020 at the latest. So the most important point is that we want to try to mainstream the disability issue and to guarantee and to ensure real participation of all stakeholders in this process. So the lessons learned from the new, from the first action plan, we hope that they will lead to a better action plan uh, for the next decade. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Ruby. Very good presentation. Thank you, Dr. Rubish. And next uh, we have His Royal Highness Prince Mirad. His Royal Highness Prince Mirad currently serves as the chairman of the National Committee for Demining and Rehabilitation and the president of the Hashemite Commission for Disabled Soldiers in Jordan. He also serves as the special envoy of the Anti-Personnel Mine Ban Convention. I might just say as an offset, I in the past have sponsored legislation in the U.S we should ban all mines globally, all over the world, once and for all. So thank you for your support for that, Your Royal Highness. He is also the president of the Higher Council for the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, a position he has held since 2014. Prince Mirad. Uh, thank you, Senator Harkin, for the, your very kind introduction. Uh, good, e uh, good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's, I'm so happy to be here with you, and I just like to uh, give a shout out to uh, uh, Martin Essel for the kind invitation uh, to me and my delegation to attend this uh, great uh, conference. It's our fourth time, and uh, uh, I think it's just absolutely marvelous. Um, 
I have been, for the last week or two, think, trying to think of what, what I could say that will not uh, bore you to death or I, how I can keep you awake. Uh, the issue of uh, disability rights and uh, disability in general in Jordan is a, we consider it very much a niche area. Uh, and we in Jordan are very much like uh, the majority of developing countries. Uh, we, uh, uh, we have some, I mean, we're doing really great on some, on some issues, but, uh, but uh, we, do we do face the same problems that uh, developing countries uh, face in, in general. Uh, so it, it is a struggle uh, trying to keep uh, disability uh, on the agenda, uh, trying to keep it uh, front and center, uh, trying to get our politicians and our, our government bureaucrats to, to concentrate on the issue and understand how important the issue is, uh, is, is quite a challenge. Um, it's a great, it's a great honor, of, co of course, for me to, to lead the charge on this uh, back home. Uh, I, since 2014, I've been the, the president of our higher council for the rights of persons with disabilities. Uh, before being the, the higher council for the rights of persons with disabilities, it was the higher council for the affairs of persons with disabilities. But, but as of two years ago, we had a, we legislated a new law for the rights of persons with disabilities, which we're extremely proud uh, proud of, uh, and we think it's uh, the most progressive uh, and forward-looking uh, law, uh, in, in at least in, in the, within the Arab world. We're very proud of the law. Of course, uh, uh, the law is just uh, words on paper. Uh, and uh, of course now the onus is on us as a country to try to implement implement the law. So this is where we are at the moment, trying to implement uh, the law. Uh, what we do as a, a higher higher council, of course, is interact with all the government bodies and all the government agencies and the ministries, and uh, to try and uh, uh, to work with them uh, on uh, formulating strategies and, and policies regarding uh, disability and all on all the various fields, whether it, whether it be accessibility or health or education or employment, on all the, on the whole spectrum. Uh, so this this, in a sense, is really where the where we, we do face difficulty because it's uh, working with government bureaucrats all across, the, right across the board. Uh, and uh, in many instances, working with people who have maybe had little interaction with, with persons with disabilities or have not been sensitized to the issues of, of uh, disabilities. So uh, it, is, it, is an uphill, it is an uphill struggle, but it's, no, it's, uh, it's of course, uh, uh, so important that uh, we do continue the struggle. And I, I would just like to uh, uh, maybe give a send out a message to other countries other countries developing countries that uh, it is it is doable you know one one of the issues that worries me is the great gulf the great gap between the developed world and the developing and, and the developing uh, world uh, there's such a huge gulf um, you know the countries european countries the western world is uh, you know they're on such a high level of have reached such a high level of sophistication whereas uh, the majority of developing countries around the world, you know, have, many have, don't even have the basics, don't, don't even have the ABCs, and uh, so it's uh, how do we bridge that, uh, that uh, gap in the, in the future, and, and uh, I can just maybe talk from, on, as, a, as a, a person or on, my, on behalf of my country that, uh, you know, we started off also uh, once upon a time with really not having anything at all. And uh, now uh, we are we are we are way ahead. We're not yet there. Uh, by, we're not. We haven't reached our goals by any stretch of the imagination. But but uh, it, it is do doable. It is possible. And uh, it's just being able to see through the fog. I think which is uh, so important. Uh, and most developing countries are so overwhelmed with so many uh, so many issues, a multitude of so many different problems and and the challenges and uh, it's trying to be able to see through the fog and and, and to uh, like they say uh, chew gum and walk at the same time and and, and uh, my, my my always my argument with our decision makers and our ministers and our politicians back home is that uh, uh, we have to be able to do many things at the same time and it's uh, and it's always a question of where where is where does uh, where does where is this ability on the priority ladder uh, is disability 
on the priority ladder? And if it is on the priority ladder, where is it on the priority ladder? Is it way down low, or is it halfway up, or is it way all the way up? And, uh, and this is the, always the question, and, and with our politicians back home, it's always a question, oh, funding, 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 we don't have the money to, to, to implement. And, it, and, it, and my, my answer always is to, to them is that, well, it's, I don't think it's a question of so much, uh, it's, it's not so much a question of funding, but it's a question of priorities. If, if it is a high priority, then the funding, funding, the resources would be made available. So, um, but of course, it's uh, having, having funds, of course, makes it makes it that, lot, that much easier. Um, I want to, if, if, uh, just to tackle just two issues that we've been uh, working on very diligently, and the, and the first is the question of uh, DI, uh, deinstitutionalization. And I, and I must say that uh, I'm very thankful for uh, Georgette Malher's very sweet words today in, the, in the room one. Uh, regarding our initiative in Jordan uh, um, on, on working with on DI, and I must say it's really thanks to the uh, Zero Project that a few years ago I uh, I had my first meeting with Georgette just outside here, just outside M1, and we sat and chatted, and that was the maybe the meeting that cemented our relationship, and, uh, and from then on things uh, snowballed, and uh, now we have a fully fledged uh, DI. Uh, program and uh, we managed to, leg in our law that I mentioned, we, we legislated, uh, or we have several articles on, on DI and, uh, and it was, a, it was a, quite a contentious and difficult issue to work on back home in Jordan and, uh, uh, and that's an, another issue I would like to just give, a, give another uh, message to all countries facing uh, issues like, like Jordan on, on the institutionalization is that go for it. Even though it's difficult, just go for it because it's the right thing to do. And, uh, and when it dawned upon us that uh, we had a, a DI uh, or institutional, institutionalization problem back home in Jordan, uh, I thought to myself, oh my goodness, you know, how, how could this have come about? And, uh, and uh, we, we, uh, we, I in, we insisted on, uh, on a clause in our law to deinstitutionalize. And uh, at first it was earth shattering and, and, uh, and people were telling me, no, 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 this can't, you can't do this and it's impossible. And, uh, you know, there will be a lot of pushback, and they shouldn't do this. And uh, it's it's a great uh, it's a great uh, investment of many of the many of the centers or the orphanages, or they are making a lot of money, and this is good for the country. And I, and I was absolutely horrified by the, by these arguments. And uh, we uh, and I, despite uh, I said I told that to my staff and to my uh, to all those working with me, I said, listen, uh, come what may, this is absolutely wrong. What is happening, and we need to deinstitutionalize our, our institutions and turn them into daycare centers or, or anything else. But uh, we can't, uh, can't keep uh, uh, our, uh, our children with disabilities or, or uh, young adults in, in these orphanages. And uh, so anyhow, it, we've, been, we've worked on it and it's, uh, it's hopefully in the, in the years to come, it's all going to, all going to pan out. Um, since I'm running out of time, I'll quickly uh, just say a few words about our, also our uh, electoral sites. Uh, we're very keen on making all our electoral sites in Jordan accessible uh, uh, for our municip municipal elections and as well as our parliamentary elections. Uh, in the past, our, uh, our persons with disabilities have uh, not, been, not been present. They've, uh, have the percentage of persons with disabilities who have voted and has been minimal. I'm not sure exactly what the percentage is, but I, it's really uh, not, not a big percentage whatsoever. And so we hope in the, in the very near future that uh, uh, not, uh, we want, it'll take a long time until all our electoral sites are accessible, but will we have a good number of electoral sites that are accessible? I, I really hope so. And, and not only that, but we want to get persons with disabilities also running for uh, municipal office and also running for for uh, uh, for parliament and uh, and I I am a firm believer that of the importance of this and I hope it will come about in the future. So uh, I thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Prince Murad. And now we will have uh, Macalada Placencia Pereiro from the European Commission in Brussels. Uh, she is not here, but I am told will be joining us by Skype. 
Uh, uh, Ms. Placencia Pereiro is a senior expert in disability and inclusion at the directorate level of general employment, social affairs, and inclusion at the European Commission. Her unit is responsible for the coordination of European policies for persons with disabilities. She works on European disability policies, including the European Disability Strategy 2010-2020 and the EU implementation of the CRPD. She holds a degree in physics and computer science, worked in research and development, but she joined the European Commission in 1991. She has worked on research programs addressing accessibility as well as assistive technologies. She was deputy head of unit for various disability related units in the commission. She was also responsible for the task force for the preparation of the European Accessibility Act and remains responsible since its adoption in 2015. And so we welcome Ms. Placencia Porrero. Okay. Good uh, morning. I hope you can hear me well. Um, I am really sorry I could not be with you today, and I'm really grateful to the Zero Project team for having offered the possibility to uh, allow you to, to connect the Skype and provide uh, this uh, uh, brief address. With my presentation, I would like to give you two uh, main messages. First, uh, to give you an overview of the main instruments, um, overarching instruments, uh, on disability policy at European level. Second, I will try to give you some uh, examples of key initiatives, key recent developments that I am very confident we have a positive, uh, important impact in um, persons with disabilities in, uh, in Europe. It's not a surprise that the um, main instrument that we have um, set in our policies is the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. Since 2010, the EU is a party, and since last uh, year, all of member states are now a party. So we have a very important uh, development in having completed the full ratification of at the new level and uh, at the member states level uh, last uh, year. In order to implement the convention, we have developed a strategy, the European Disability Strategy. And I will give you a little overview of its key content and where we are today. Because uh, we have been developing the strategy for almost uh, 10 years now. Um, and um, now at this moment we are engaging on its evaluation. Why is that? Because in uh, next year, 2020, we will have a new European Commission and we need to present the results of the 10 years of work so that a decision can be taken about um, the future strategy. So if I can go to the next slide, the strategy is a comprehensive instrument that crosses um, all kinds of um, EU uh, instruments uh, and areas of competence. It's about accessibility, participation, equality, employment, education, uh, health, external action, uh, collection of statistics, and, and so forth. The idea is to, to, on one hand, empower persons with disabilities to enjoy the full rights, while also implementing the Convention and ensuring the creation of a barrier-free Europe. That is why this strategy has a strong emphasis on accessibility. If I can get the next slide, um, I will, oh sorry, the previous, previous one, sorry. Yeah, that one, yeah. So, uh, as I said, the Convention is guiding our work, but of course we have already been uh, in 2015 uh, to have the structured dialogue with the Committee on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, and we are also using the strategy to implement 
the uh, concluding observations that, that we received. I have to say that uh, the three uh, recommendations that were um, that were addressed in the EU to be done within one year have been mainly achieved. Uh, the Accessibility Act, I will say a little, a few words afterwards, is uh, it's um, almost uh, finalized adoption. We will have the final voting in Parliament in March, and then uh, we will have to start to work with the Member States in order to transpose this piece of legislation. In the progress report of the strategy, we had um, updated the list of legal acts um, that um, uh, address implementation of the Convention. And we have seen, this is really a reflection of the uh, progress uh, achieved. When uh, in 2009, the, uh, sorry, 2010, the Council adopted the decision for conclusion of the Convention by the EU, there were 40 EU legal acts that were included in the Declaration of Conflict. In the progress report adopted last year, um, uh, we have identified over 130 pieces of legislation that cover all kinds of areas as mentioned before. The next uh, point was to remove the Commission from the EU monitoring framework in order to ensure the independence and separation of the roles of monitoring from implementation, and that was done immediately after the, um, receiving the concluding observations. I have to say that we are already starting preparing um, for the next uh, period of reporting, which will be in 2021. If I can get the next slide, um, I would have to, this is an example of how we are working uh, in order to implement the Convention. Um, a couple of years ago, uh, ago the, the um, Commission adopted the European Pillar of Social Rights, and we can see that in the pillar, disability policies are well reflected. This is the, the pillar is the major instrument to address social policy at EU level. And not only do we have a specific principle about the inclusion of persons with States, 
um, eleven we do this every year and um, we have we issue reports to each of the member states in which we address disability concerns in relation to education, employment and social protection. This year is also very important because we have uh, going to have in the month of May um, uh, the European elections and while those elections are carried out at member state level and they, the organization of them is a member state issue, um, every year the Commission issues certain recommendations um, um, about how to carry out these elections. And for the first time ever, uh, in, the, in these documents, the, uh, uh, there is a recommendation to promote the exercise of electoral rights for underrepresented groups, including uh, persons with disabilities. So there is a first mention of persons with disabilities in the context of access to those elections. We are also progressing with the issuing of the disability card, the European disability card. The issue, the assessment of disability and the issues of benefits is a member state competence, but we have managed to set up a voluntary system that um, allows the mutual recognition of the card and the access to certain measures. We also support, continue to support uh, the um, disability organizations at European level and have invested very much, are investing on awareness raising initiatives. But of course the main uh, element is the that we have today, or the main instruments I would like to discuss with you today is um, the ones that we have been adopting very recently last year on accessibility. The first one is, and I, I can have the next slide, the European Accessibility Act. I'm not going to enter into detail of the Act, but uh, if I can have the next slide, basically what the Act does, it puts obligations on accessibility, uh, next slide please, on a number of products and services. Products are consumer uh, general computers, uh, operating systems, self-service terminals, um, um, terminal equipment for telecommunications and audiovisual media services, as well as e-readers. It also puts obligations of services in the next slides, and we're talking about electronic communication, audiovisual media services, certain elements of transport, banking, e-books, and e-commerce. It is very important to realize that this is a general accessibility legislation that interacts with many other pieces of legislation. It has got um, accessibility requirements and an enforcement mechanism that would allow that um, in the market, in the European market, we will have these accessible products and services. It interacts, for example, I mean, let me take one example, the e-books and e-readers. Um, when the Act, uh, with the application of the Act, um, e-books placed in the European market will have to be accessible from the onset as well as the e-readers. This would complement very well the Marrakesh uh, Treaty in which books can be retrofitted to be um, accessible. Also, for example, we will have e-commerce being made accessible. If I can get the next slide, I would like to say that we are using the accessibility requirements that are uh, in, the, in the Act uh, to um, provide um, accessibility, to render operational accessibility obligations or requirements in other Acts. For example, in uh, oh, is the previous one a slide, the previous slide, please, public procurement, the structure of funds, which is the main funds that they uh, give, trans-European networks and the related funds to create the European... Um, uh, trans-European networks. Um, of course, there is also a link with sector-specific legislation. There, we are very proud to, to say that um, this year also we are completing the framework um, that you can see in the next slide, in which we are going to have, in addition to the accessibility requirements in the private sector that the Accessibility Act has, also um, we have legislation on public sector obligations, and we have the same accessibility requirements. We also have um, a, a telecommunications legislation that contains provisions on accessibility on uh, that relates, or uh, sorry, provisions on persons with disability that relates to equal access for persons with disabilities, availability and affordability of telecommunications. And we also have progressive obligations in audiovisual media services so that the services are accessible, so the content 
TV programs are accessible, but also those means that are used in order to access those programs like websites or uh, set up uh, boxes. Um, in the next slide, I would just to finish to tell you that we have made also great progress in the development of standards. You know that the standard on ICT accessibility, which is very well harmonized and uh, made coherent with the US legislation, is already available for a couple of years. I would like to encourage um, all of you that need the standardization to use it. This is why we are producing these standards. Um, on the area of the built environment, the current uh, draft standard is on inquiry vote, so in a couple of months we will know that if there is agreement uh, of the national bodies that we will have a European standard, which is also very much harmonized with um, at international level with ISO and, and also with um, US um, requirements. And finally, we have adopted one standard, which is a kind of process-oriented standard. Basically, that standards, um, and you have the numbers then, this is a very new one, EN 17161, will tell you if you are an organization and you want to deliver inclusive products, services, whatever your activities is, you want to be disability inclusive and have accessible results, you need to follow a process, you need to adopt certain measures, and this standard will really guide you on how to do, uh, how to do that. Please use them, they are available uh, for um, advancing on this um, area. So what is next? Next, uh, just to finish, we are going to finalize the, implement, the implementation of the strategy. We have one more year to go until 2020, as we committed in 2010. But at the same time, we are evaluating what we have done because we want to be ready by 2020 to um, say how we did it, uh, what we did it, did we achieve our objectives, and present also what's next, how are we going to um, address the next decade at European level in terms of policy, of disability policy. And of course, we need to prepare uh, for the next periodic report, so the, two th the, the timing matches very well, as we have to go on um, January 2021 to uh, the UN um, reporting on our activities. In the meantime, we will continue to mainstream disability in key policy developments and future EU actions. So this is what I had prepared for the presentation, and I thank you for your attention. And thank you very much for joining us from Brussels. Uh, next, we will have uh, Michael Rimon, the CEO of Access Israel, the first and only nonprofit organization in Israel dedicated to promote accessibility and inclusion for people with all kinds of disabilities in Israel. Prior to joining Access Israel, uh, Ms. Ramon was the spokesperson for Ambassadors Dory Gold and Dr. Yehuda Lankri at the Israeli Mission to the UN. She later worked as a lawyer for M Systems and SanDisk. In 2007, Ms. Ramon started working at Access Israel as a general counsel and later established the education and training department in the organization. In 2011, she became the CEO of Access Israel, leading the organization in its activities in Israel and abroad. Welcome, Ms. Ramon. Thank you. Thank you very much. I was so busy preparing for the trail, I didn't have time to go over what they sent. It was a bit too long, but uh, thank you for the introduction. I, I usually like to introduce myself as Michal Rimon, the proud CEO of Access Israel, proud of my employees, my volunteers. Uh, some of them are sitting here uh, with us and others are looking from Israel and definitely it's be it, it, thanks to them that I'm here and being able to present the progress. Um, so as you said, Access Israel, uh, accessibility is in the name, but it is not our goal. Our goal is true inclusion, reaching true inclusion, improvement of quality of life for people with uh, all types of disabilities in all areas of life. Accessibility is the um, means to uh, achieve that goal, of course. Um, and I think the amazing part of my job, and I think 
all of the people sitting around here, is that when you're dealing with accessibility and inclusion, uh, it's a hard work, and I think I agree with uh, the previous uh, uh, speakers that there's still a long way to go, but we go out, look up, and see the change in front of us, and I think that's something very rewarding, and I feel privileged to uh, be able to say that. Um, the clicker, thank you. So uh, the Israeli law uh, has an umbrella law, uh, the law for the rights, uh, the equal rights of people uh, with disabilities, uh, promoting uh, equality and accessibility in all areas of life for people with all types of disability, uh, requiring the various ministries to legislate reg regulations relevant to their area of focus. Uh, with us uh, here, um, Yotam, the CEO of Bizchut, and Gabi from the Commissioner's Office uh, for the Rights of People with Disabilities, two of the leading organizations that promoted this uh, uh, law, and uh, Access Israel joined in the chapters dealing with accessibility. Um, uh, and the accessibility standards give a detailed specification on how to reach such accessibility. These law uh, uh, these laws apply to everyone, to the government, to the municipalities, uh, to the private sectors, and to uh, NGOs uh, in Israel. It gives like a guideline, and we are uh, still not finished with all the legislation, but we're definitely progressing nicely. I think that um, it's uh, easy to say that the challenges we face in Israel are similar to many of your country's uh, challenges, budget, stigmas, uh, old cities that we have to uh, uh, turn into uh, accessible ones. Um, however, there are certain advantages uh, in Israel um, that, uh, that uh, I think uh, is important to point out. First of all, our law has teeth. Um, uh, criminal, civil, um, uh, if you do not do what the law requires, there are ways um, to come and, and, and uh, file uh, lawsuits against you. I can tell you Access Israel for many years uh, was um, avoiding that option because we believe in the positive way of convincing people of the win-win-win um, uh, of a profitable um, business uh, addressing 100% of their potential uh, customer uh, base. Uh, but sometimes we have no choice and the law, these teeth are very important. In Israel, accessibility is done on a country level. And uh, that is uh, also something very important. It still does not mean that the periphery or uh, all areas are accessible. We have a long way to go, but you start seeing it more and more uh, as you uh, go around Israel. And I think another unique aspect in Israel is that by law, every service provider is required to go through accessible uh, service training every single year, and at least one in, once in the lifetime of the employee, they have to do um, uh, something very experiential to understand. You remember my uh, pitch yesterday, don't just talk the talk, but walk the walk. So that is by law in Israel, which is something pretty amazing, and it's something that we are very proud to uh, uh, do uh, for many, many sectors of uh, the Israeli uh, uh, society. Um, the subject this year was independent living, and when we're talking independence, we all want uh, uh, to see uh, independence at home, in the neighborhood, or the city we live, we live in, um, when we're accepting services in the social arena, employment, this is all part of being independent. If uh, we don't have this circle of independence, then we just are not achieving our goals. Um, but uh, it is important to say that today, independence uh, has to be also on another new level. And this is what I'm going to focus my last five minutes of uh, presentation. Uh, and that is independence in the technological era. Today, we are advancing homes. We're talking smart homes. We're talking smart cities. We're talking digital services. We're talking social medias and uh, technology surrounding uh, our workplace. Technology is everywhere, and you know, in my fascinating uh, conversations with uh, representatives from all kinds of big, you know, Microsoft, Google, uh, they, they're telling me that what I'm dreaming of is, is already old news. I mean, uh, it's going to be even more. Uh, so technology is uh, the future, and it's around us. Um, and the question is, how is accessibility going to cope with this change? 
So now in Israel, we are focusing on revisions to legislation. Uh, following the experience we have gained uh, from implementation of uh, the laws that I mentioned before. We have already uh, legislations that deal with uh, web accessibility, call centers, etc. But uh, this is just the tip of the iceberg as we know it. Um, and uh, we are at the point where we can really change the way we have dealt with accessibility up till now. Up till now we have been doing it retroactively, fixing fixing the physical, fixing the services. Today we are in an era that we can really look forward and create an accessible future without fixing. Making sure that technology is accessible by design from day one. We have been working uh, for the past 20 years on creating a change um, and as I said, we have improved greatly the situation in Israel as far as accessibility goes. But we have to understand that in the technological era, if we do not make sure that the changes are done now towards the future, the gap is going to widen. And while uh, the technologies, if they will not be accessible, we will have a situation where people with disabilities will not be able to participate in daily uh, uh, activities. Try to think about uh, automated cars. If they will not be accessible and everyone can just go into a car and you know, snap their hands or talk and the car will start going, well, if you can't talk, you can't go in the car. And if you can't see, you won't know how to operate it. And if, you, if there's no ramp, you can't go on it. And then you're just left on the sideboard and uh, you cannot participate in the daily activity that will be uh, everybody's uh, uh, daily life. On a financial level, we have to remember that whenever you fix things, it's more, more expensive. And if you will do it um, uh, in advance, then you'll be able to achieve a win-win-win situation, cost-effective, definitely. The way we do it, we believe in awareness, first of all, raising awareness, fixing the legislation, um, showing models for implementation, uh, creating innovation centers, encouraging uh, um, technologies to really uh, incorporate and make a change, consult those willing and, and uh, showing them the way to reach this goal. Um, Zero Project is a great platform, I'm enabling in Washington, uh, all these international arenas, because basically what I'm talking about, I might be representing Israel, but what I'm talking about is definitely a global issue, and it's something that we should all uh, strive to uh, achieve um, uh, and do. The future is here, basically. We in Israel and Access Israel are focusing on turning this into a national level initiative, and it's definitely one of those subjects, as I said, that are totally global, and I hope each and every one is going to uh, join us, and I cannot believe it, but I'm on time. <laughs> Achieving a small goal every day. Thank you, guys. Thank you very much, Ms. Ramon. And next we turn to uh, Helga Stevens of the European Parliament. Helga Stevens of Belgium is the first female deaf member of the European Parliament. She is Vice President of the ECR Group and Co-Chair of the European Parliament Disability Intergroup. Previously, she was a member of the Flemish Parliament and a Senator. She's a lawyer by training, and before entering politics in 2004, she worked as an attorney and as a consultant for the European Union of the Deaf. So we welcome Helga Stevens of the European Parliament. Yes, thank you very much. Well, I, I might think I'll stand up. Maybe that's easier for me even with sign language. I hope everybody's fine with that. So, dear ladies and gentlemen, um, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to address you today. And uh, first I would like to discuss the right for uh, political participation that is very important as in May 2019 there will be elections in Europe as you all know and uh, as well as national and regional elections in some different countries like in Belgium, Spain and probably some other countries. 
Uh, to be clear, uh, people with disabilities have a right to uh, in political participation according to Article 29 in the UNCRPD. I think I'll, 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 I'm not going to read it to you, so you all know about it. So uh, note that the CRPD um, does not give disabled people new rights, uh, but it makes clear or it clarifies and explains that uh, people with disabilities should enjoy the same rights that all citizens without disabilities do all around the world. The uh, opportunity is to be involved in political life every day, whether if I'm standing for elected office or electing a candidate or joining a political party or listening to some political debate going on or even reading about political news and stories in, in the media, for example, every day. And that is what it means to live in a democratic society. So it gives an accessibility and an enable environment so people with uh, disabilities can join in their communities. So, and as you all know, there are more than enough barriers that are still there. Um, in order to address these challenges, the European Union and Parliament, as well as the organizations for security and cooperation in Europe, um, they have placed this topic very high on the agenda and they're working hard to convince member states to take real actions to remove these barriers for people with disabilities in political and public life. While, um, while I was pre preparing the speech, um, I took a look and I saw, well, there are actually many organizations and international foundations um, that are working on their electoral systems and they're already making some progress in uh, making them accessible. And well, that's positive. Um, but I mean, that's not the only important thing. We still need uh, to, to continue to join the effort and um, help force governments to adopt the legislation and make the elections more accessible. Your national governments are legally responsible for the organization uh, to the political process and election in every country, in your country. So only if you stand up and you organize yourselves, then your governments will maybe listen to you. Um, after all, politics is all about power and political parties, and they like to be fully in charge of the power. But in this context, it is absolutely vital that persons with disability need to organize themselves and stand up for their political rights. Uh, they must claim their rights to vote and to stand for elections and make themselves hard. To make this work, work, they must involve or let us kind of like say influence the mainstream, like influence the political parties, since they are actually the place to be if you want to change things. So, the right to full participation in political and public um, goes hand in hand with inclusion and accessibility. Only, um, only when a society is truly accessible, then people with disability will be fully able to participate in public and political life. Otherwise, there are still more than enough barriers and they'll have a problem. For example, if, um, if there are stairs, then someone with, in a wheelchair will not be able to access. Um, if um, deaf people need maybe um, papers or uh, blind people need um, other documents. In, uh, if the information is not provided also in easy to read language or um, format, then persons with learning or intellectual disabilities will also be included. 
or if uh, the public transportation or trains or buses are not accessible, then people who are unable to drive a car are unable to come to a political meeting, for example. It is not hard to see how inaccessibility leads to exclusion of many people, and I think we must fight this. As politicians, political parties or parliaments are about democracy and society, and since society is diverse, diversity should be an integral part of political, political actions and in parliament. After all, political parties want to get the maximum numbers of votes, and that only works if you reach out as many people as possible, including citizens with disabilities. And that makes sense, doesn't it? So this leads me to stressing the importance of accessibility, accessibility measures. After a long process and debate in the European Parliament and at the EU, European level, the Council's Permanent Representative Committee finally adopted the European Accessibility Act back in uh, December 2018. So, yeah, we, have, we heard that before. Um, you, you, we, could, we could see the slide how this process worked, so I won't really um, explain anything on this topic to you. Um, while the European Disability Act does not go as far as we had hoped, that's one of the problems, but it's still a step in the right direction. Accessibility requirements, for example, with the regards to ramps, to doors, to public toilets, to staircases, uh, currently vary across the UN countries. In order to make the built environment uh, pro progressively more accessible to disabled persons, the European Accessibility Act encourages member states to align the requirements as much as possible. And the Commission contains a review clause requires the European Commission to access the situation. So we'll see five years from now how far we have been. In addition, the EAA sets out rules on products and services. So now I'll move on a little farther. I believe that the European Union has missed an opportunity to learn from the United States and to align its policy uh, in, on accessibility with the United States. Uh, due to its complicated institutional setup, European lacks ambition with regard to accessibility. Mm, this is also because many member states do not understand that there is a positive direct link between accessibility and inclusion of persons with disabilities. Accessibility leads to inclusion. And we've also heard about that before from uh, Mrs. Ramon. And, um, but instead, the governments have um, only looking at short-term costs for accessibilities. So the barriers must be removed. In an accessible and barrier-free society, more persons with disabilities could function independently and would be able to go to school, to work or shopping on their own if all these points would, would, have, would have been made possible. But in fact, it is actually that what persons with disability want, they just want equal opportunities, not more, not less. They just want equality, equal treatments, and equal opportunities. And of course, full access to all different um, possibilities and supports. But we all know that it's still 
not that way. We still know that there are... Ah, sorry, I missed the last sentence. <laughs> yeah, so I would like to finish <laughs> with the words of Barack Obama saying, yes, we can, <laughs> and I hope we can. <laughs> Thank you very much, Helga Stevens. Uh, I could understand most of that because I understand ASL. That was close. <laughs> now uh, we move to uh, Tara Doheny. Tara Doheny from Geneo in Ireland. Tara Doheny is a program manager in disability. She has been with Geneo since 2010 and has been instrumental in developing the disability and mental health programs, as well as the development and delivery of Geneo's capacity building program. Through her work, she provides direct support to organizations which have been awarded funding through the Geneo Trust in their change management process. Having worked with over 140 projects across Ireland, she brings a wealth of experience and knowledge to her role. Welcome, Tara Doheny. Thank you very much for the introduction. Um, my presentation is also going to echo what other presenters have talked about today. Can you hear me? Can you just hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Maybe the volume's not. Um, it's going to echo what other uh, presenters have talked about today. Um, we're all on a journey. Um, the work that we have been working on in Ireland, um, we have come a long way, but we still have a long way to go. Um, so I just want that to be kept in mind as I uh, present. Okay. Um, so Genio um, is a non-profit organisation um, working with government and philanthropy um, to help transform um, social services nationally. Um, like many countries, social services in Ireland um, are very complex. Government faces significant challenges um, in transforming services within their finite resources um, that are blocked in traditional um, services, um, and little funding is available um, for innovative funding. In 2010, uh, Genio joined partnerships with um, philanthropy and government and uh, they created a fund, um, an innovative fund, and supported um, a total of 210 projects between 200, uh, 2010 and 2015, of which 140 of those were disability. These projects would have, um, were pilot projects um, around the institution, um, alternative respite, and looking at work, training, and employment for people with disabilities. Um, all of these grants would have been um, extensively performance managed. Um, there was huge capacity building um, to all stakeholders involved in the grants. And during that time, um, um, a large amount of evidence was gathered across all the grant uh, streams to find out what was working and, more importantly, what wasn't working, what we needed to change. Based on the pilot phase, then, um, the the government again and genuine philanthropy worked together and we developed the service reform fund. Um, this private funding was used as a catalyst to refocus the total public spending um, and to produce better outcomes and be more cost effective. Um, so this was a total fund of 45 million um, across disability, mental health and um, uh, more recently homelessness service. This was the first time in Ireland before government, uh, different government departments came together and sat down to see how can we make this work? How can our piece of funding um, be put into the pot um, to reform services nationally and to make um, um, supports um, better for people with disabilities in Ireland? So, um, out of this fund, at the minute, we have 16 large grants um, and disability, totaling 7.9 million uh, has been awarded. And to date, um, there has been a number of large institutions closed, and by the end of 2020, there will be 10. Um, and there is one of the, our beneficiary grantees in the room here today, down the back. I won't ask them to stand up, um, but I'm sure they'll be able to share their experiences um, um, with us if needs be. Um, 
This is very much a partnership. Everybody was at the table from um, the very start of this with government and philanthropy, and we needed to um, create an understanding. So we developed a memorandum of understanding that we quite often need to go back to and reflect. There was a criteria set out under each of the grant streams as to how funding was going to be allocated. And it was allocated on a competitive basis people had to write in and apply for that funding. It was very rigorous where stakeholders who were receiving services were at the centre um, of the, um, the, the, the application development and sustainability. After the period of time of the grant, the innovative grant, how was it going to be sustained? Uh, when applications come in for funding, then um, a robust um, grants committee, which involved family members, people with lived experience sitting on that committee, um, and it was uh, marked against very um, stringent um, criteria. Unfortunately, um, we couldn't bring, um, people weren't available to come, some of our stakeholders, so we have a short clip just because they wanted to get their voice here today, so we're going to show that next, I hope. No, it's not me. <laughs> <laughs> Change is difficult, so having a partnership approach really is the key ingredient to making sure that we can bring everybody together, but keeping the individual or the person at the centre of that process. If you are ambitious about improving service delivery to a large cohort of people, you have to recognise that the principal system interacting with those service users is the governmental system. Right from the start, we have had an interest in seeing could we bring philanthropy and government together to work to change whole systems, building a service in a very personalised, tailored way around the individual needs, and also doing this in a very cost-effective way. This is beginning to bring about dramatic improvements in the lives of service users, while generally doing so in a cost-neutral or more cost-effective way. Very small pieces of funding actually can be very crucial in actually facilitating um, what is very challenging for people in terms of moving from decades of institutional arrangements and institutional practices. Everybody involved can see that this is more beneficial, it is more cost effective, it's delivering the outcomes uh, that you know, people with challenges want for themselves. You can actually live rather than exist in your own home, in your own space. And now I have a life where I hadn't before. The focus is always on what it is that service users need. And, you know, that was not the case 10 years ago. And that is a real sea change. So that just gives a, a small flavor of some of our, our stakeholders I suppose it's very important to say that once um, funds is awarded um, to the grantees, we do spend a lot of time supporting them. Um, uh, Selena and Annette's laughing at me down the back because I'm always in their service, having uh, making sure that they're meeting their aims and activities. Each grant is different; they're not all the same. Um, so each grant has a grant contract with a specific set of aims and activities to be achieved over a period of time. In partnership with our government, we do on-site visits to see how those are going every six months and review what needs to change, what is not working. And then we also do a lot of workshops where we bring like-minded people who have achieved or have um, been able to overcome a specific challenge or, or, or barrier and share that with others as we go on this journey. We're all learning. Um, as well as that, we've developed a training programme called Support of Self-Directed Living, where in large institutions where we would have a number of nursing staff working, they're good people, they just need to know how to support and work with individuals in a different way. This training is a, a nine-month programme, it's modular, and staff need to be freed up to work with people in a different way. Um, so this programme of work through the Service Reform Fund is really from the grassroots, bottom-up, top-down. I just 
I'm getting my two minutes here, sorry. I just want you to see some of these individual people. I just wanted to share a few pictures with you to bring it to life again. Um, Declan has moved his new um, home in the community where he was born after spending almost three decades living in an institution. Uh, and this man had a staff nurse working with him for 19 years. And after attending the training, she actually said, I didn't actually know that Declan liked coffee. Um, so just some very simple things in life that make things easier for people. So his family there, you can see um, his mum and dad found it very difficult to come to the institution to visit him and, and they have, they're so delighted now that he's so happy living out in his own community with people he chooses to live with. And then we have John. We call them the twins, John and his father here. And again, a similar story in the, in the south of the country. Um, he had been living in an institution for three decades. And um, we, it's very, to get this picture, it was very difficult to get John uh, on a day that he wasn't out in the community doing um, and meeting people. So it just um, shows just how people's life has changed. And just on my last slide, just to reiterate some of the things that I'd said, um, the f it is a large fund, but when you divide it out among the different social service areas, a very small amount of money goes a long way. And if it's performance managed along the way, it, it can make significant changes for people using and needing services. Um, and it's unlocking resources. So as I said at the start, people need to bring something to the table. It's not an endless pot of money. They need to reform uh, and reconfigure their own service to ensure that this continues. And it's all in line with national policy. Um, so it's very important to have competitive application process. So people see now and know when we say service reform fund, you just don't get money. You have to compete for it. And it does ca uh, cause a bit of um, problems in Ireland because people say think they're entitled to get the money, but they have to compete for it. Um, and the evaluation is against very strict uh, criteria. And um, I've just got my time out. So, um, so any questions, I'm here afterwards and come up and ask me. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much, Mr. Doheny. And now we turn to Klaus Lockowitz, a human rights lawyer from Germany with the International Disability Alliance and the European Disability Forum in Switzerland. Uh, for more than 30 years, he worked for, and Klaus, I'm going to try this, Bundesverengung Lebenshelf. Close. <laughs> he'll, he'll, he'll get it right when he, takes, when he gets the mic. It's a DPO representing persons with intellectual disabilities and their families as head of the legal department and executive director. He was president of the Inclusion International for eight years, from 2010 to 2018. He is the secretary general of the International Disability Alliance in Geneva and New York City since 2016, a member of the executive committee of the European Disability Forum in Brussels since 2014. Uh, together with colleagues, he has published in 2014 the first legal commentary on the CRPD in German language. Klaus Lockwitz. Thank you and good afternoon. I want to talk a little bit about the essential elements of political participation. Well, these elements are defined and described in the CRPD. It's an individual right to take part in elections. This is described in Article 29. And what we should not forget, we have another important Article 4, Section 3, describing the right to, to, to participate as organization in all developments within legislation and policies. The right to be heard as an organization. Well, we have already heard by Helga Stevens that Article 29 states very clearly that all persons with disabilities have the right to vote and to be elected. Nobody is exempted from that. Everybody is entitled to vote. And in comparison with that, the reality is quite different. We have quite a lot of countries where you have the right to vote as a disabled person, but to become elected and to have an official position 
in the parliament, you find only a few persons with disabilities. Helga Stevens is one of the exceptions. But there are hardly any persons with cognitive impairments who serve in such bodies. That's the reality we have to face. Well, there's a new study published by the European Economic and Social Committee, which is an advisory body of the European Commission and of the European Parliament. And according to that study, which was just published about two or three weeks ago, we have 28 countries within the European Union, but only in 12 of these countries, all persons with disabilities are allowed to take part in elections. In nine countries, in particular persons with dementia, intellectual or psychosocial disabilities cannot take part in these elections. For instance, not allowed to take part in the elections in May 2019 for the European Parliament. And in another seven countries, your right to vote is dependent from assessment, from a medical assessment usually, and the kind of these assessments are very, very, very different in all these countries. I think that's a topic we have to discuss too. Well, but there is hope. We have succeeded within Inclusion International in particular, and we had successes by involving and by including self-advocates in our campaigns. And I want to describe some of these successful stories. The first story is from Peru, and it's Alexandra, who is an actress with Down syndrome. And she was working in a sheltered workshop, and then she was told, because you are working here, you are not allowed to take part in elections. And then she herself started to campaign because she was quite a popular actress in those days. And when she took the floor and when she took the chance or got the chance to speak up in television, she told people, why can't I take part in elections? Everybody can, but I'm not allowed to do that. I insist that I'm allowed to do that. And as a result of that, the Peru law was changed and since about four years, everybody is entitled to take part in elections. A great success. Another story was started in Japan. It's Nagoya Takumi. She was allowed to take part in elections, but for any reason I don't know, she was under full guardianship for time being, and as a result of that, she automatically lost her right to vote. And then herself and her parents started a big campaign and finally they had more than 400,000 votes from all parts of the population and as a result of that she went to the court and the district court of Tokyo told her you have the right to vote and we have to influence the House of Parliament to change the law. And within 74 days after the decision of the court was taken, the law was changed in Japan. So more than 136,000 persons are allowed to vote now in Japan. The final story is from Adolfo Barroso from Spain. I just met him three weeks ago in the House of Parliament and he told his story. And the story was that about two years ago, he wanted to take part in elections in Spain, and he went to a judge, and he asked him, can I take part in elections? And the judge told him, no, you are under guardianship, and therefore you can't take part in elections. You have to be assessed, and I will send you to a psychologist. So he went there, and then the psychologist asked him several questions. And one of the questions was, what is the speed of the light? And who is Albert Einstein? I would like to ask you, who knows the speed of the light in this room? Put up your fingers. Just a few, just a few. So when he went back to the judge, the judge said, well, more than half at least of the whole population couldn't take part in elections if this would be, would be dependent from such questions. 
So he sent him to the House of Parliament, and as a result of that, the Spanish law was changed last year, and more than 100,000 persons with intellectual disabilities can take part in elections in Spain. But still, we have these figures that in the majority of the European countries, you still can't take part in these elections. So what do we learn from all that? I think it's not the politicians, it's not the lawyers are so really helpful to implement that law. It's the persons themselves. They have to start campaigning like that was done in Spain, like that was done in Peru and in Japan, and then you will succeed. And you have to file petitions for the parliaments, you have to demonstrate, and you have to make use of the social media. These are the results of our campaigns, and I think that's an important message for at least the big majority of persons with cognitive impairments to be really accepted on an equal basis with others. Well, let me finish up with this Article 4.3. This, I think, is quite important because we have first to find out where in our global world do we have organizations representing persons with disabilities? Which kind of organizations have the right to be heard by the governments, to be invited, to be actively consulted? It depends usually from legal statutes and from the right to be registered in your country. And in many, many cases, for instance, self-advocates can't organize themselves because in the majority of countries they lack legal capacity. And without legal capacity you can't form a board, you can't register, etc., etc. So the first thing to do is to really find out to simplify and to define the term organization. And this has been done last year by the committee of the CRPD. They published a general comment, and in this general comment you find that an organization of self-advocates can be a loose platform without legal statutes. You are entitled to be really accepted as an organization without legal statutes. That's the message of this committee, and I think that's a very, very important message. So we have to fight for two things, for the implementation of Article 12 and Article 4.3. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Lockwitz. And now, to bring us to a close, we turn to Klaus Hockner. Back down here. Um, uh, here he is a member of the board of, I'll try this again. Yep. <laughs> Hilsgemeinschaft? Yep. Ah. <laughs> Based in Vienna. With more than 4,650 members, this organization is the leading privately funded organization helping visually impaired persons in Austria. He is a member of the board of the Austrian Disability Forum the Vice President of the Austrian Computer Society, as well as sitting in the IAAP's Global Leadership Council. He has an ICT background, studied at the University of Economics in Vienna, and has a degree as well as a PG in Web Accessibility and Fundraising. Klaus is working for more than 15 years in the field of accessibility, especially regarding ICT and standardization in the context of the at a European and at the international level. So again, we welcome and thank you very much for being with us, Klaus Hockner. So thank you very much. Uh, so as I'm the last one in the, in, in the queue uh, to raise the attention a little bit. Uh, in German, we say, den letzten beißen die Hunde, the devil takes the hindmost. Uh, and the second side is, uh, Let's come to something completely different. Uh, here's the nerd. As you can see, uh, when, you, when you look on my slides, the A way to A11Y, what does it mean, A11Y? Does anybody in this room know 
what's A11, why? And why 11, A11, why corresponds to a certain term? No. A11Y means accessibility. Why? A followed by 11 characters and a, and a E crack at the end. So <laughs> the Austrian way to A11Y means the Austrian way to accessibility. Uh, and what, <laughs> what I meant to say is uh, one of the crucial points uh, in participation is access to information. And access to information means uh, you have to have accessible information in websites, in ICT products, in apps, and so on and so on. And therefore, the next uh, salad of abbreviations, what we are doing here in Austria, we are talking about the what. What's the what? The what is the web accessibility directive, as mentioned by IMA, for example. Uh, and the implementation here in Austria, it's Im implemented by the so-called DIA, the Digitalization Agency Austria, which was inaugurated yesterday. Yeah? Uh, what's the AIM AT 2030? It's about accessible, uh, not accessible, sorry. <laughs> it's about artificial intelligence. One of the big topics that we have now uh, in the field of ICT, and not only in the field of ICT. And what we are doing here in Austria, we are implementing uh, certifications like the WACA, the Web Accessibility Certificate Austria for websites, and the CWAE, the certificate. Uh, certification for uh, web accessibility experts, that means personal certification. And we want to make the DACH chapter. DACH is a German uh, acronym for Germany, Austria, Switzerland, Deutschland, Österreich, Austria and Switzerland. Yeah? Uh, that means we want to bring certification uh, from the American International Association of the Accessibility Professionals here to Austria. The Web Accessibility Directive uh, is in Austria called the Web Zugänglichkeitsgesetz. Uh, web Accessibility, so it's a literal translation, uh, has passed the consultation phase here in Austria. Uh, through the Austrian Parliament, it is now in the Ministry of Digitalization. Uh, it refers to the so called WCAG, uh, the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, which are worldwide known and worldwide. Uh, these standards for web accessibility. Uh, that means when you refer, when you comply to the WCAG AA, for example, uh, then you are compliant to uh, accessibility uh, in the field uh, of, of websites, and not only in the field of websites, the WCAG also ref are referring to uh, all what's embedded on a website. Because we all know a website doesn't mean only HTML. A website also means uh, you have PDFs on it, you have Word uh, on, it, on it, you have Excel on it, and so on. And that's not an advertisement for, uh, for the big company where we had the chief accessibility officer yesterday here. Uh, but that's the reality. On most of the websites, we have uh, products from uh, Microsoft. Yeah. Uh, the Web Accessibility Directive has to be implemented throughout the EU 27 or 28. We don't know what's going on with the Brexit. <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, but it has to be implemented and uh, there, are, there has to be, it has to be monitoring uh, on, the le on the EU level. Um, in every country, now there is the uh, decision how, where and who has to do this uh, implementation of the web content uh, of the of the of the uh, web accessibility directive and the monitoring? In Austria, it's the so-called DIA, which I mentioned, uh, which was inaugurated yesterday uh, here in Vienna, and we have about 251 uh, websites to be tested in Austria in the first phase till 2021, and then uh, the number of the websites will augment. To simplify this, the uh, Commission uh, of the European Union uh, has implemented two uh, 
projects, two Horizon 2020 projects. One of these Horizon 2020 projects is the so-called Watcher, the Web Accessibility Directive Decision Support Environment Project, where we want to build up a complicated thing like that. Uh, it means we want to make a framework where you can put in uh, the results of uh, a check of our websites uh, with any tool that you want to use. Uh, it's a, like a black box and out comes uh, a report which is compliant to the Web Accessibility Directive uh, which was issued by the um, European Union. That means we want to help all the countries, all the 27 countries of the European Union, to use the same tool, to use the same output, to make it horizontally and vertically comparable uh, what they are doing with their monitoring. Then, the next big topic, artificial intelligence. As you know, the, as somebody may know, the uh, European Union is now on the way to uh, implementing strategy and AI. Uh, we are working in a group called high-level group on experts on, uh, on, on artificial intelligence now uh, on two strategy papers, on two papers for artificial intelligence in the European Union, which will be issued by uh, the end of, of April, uh, mid-April. Uh, I'm sitting in there uh, to represent uh, person with disabilities there. We have 52 persons uh, sitting, sitting in this group uh, and also all the other countries of the European Union are trying to formulate their own uh, artificial intelligence strategy uh, and we are trying to combine these strategies to make an own European strategy for uh, responsible uh, artificial intelligence use in combination with the CRPD, for example. Uh, and with a ref reference also to the rights of persons with disabilities and uh, the universal design principles. Austria will also do this strategy till, uh, till the end of the year. Uh, not till the end of the year, I think it's, it's a little bit earlier. Yeah? Uh, and we are speaking about a lot of money uh, within the next seven years. Uh, for example, Horizon 2020 has 15 billions of euros uh, reserved for the use uh, within the artificial intelligence uh, research uh, and products. And altogether, this uh, number is not on the slide. We are talking about uh, 100 billions till 20, 2027, uh, which are reserved in Europe. Now let's come to the to the ground, to Austria, the WACA, Web Accessibility Certificate Austria. Uh, there's an independent certification body which wants to uh, certify uh, websites according to uh, WCAG 2.0 AA criteria. Uh, uh, implemented, uh, not implemented, uh, inaugurated last year. Uh, we have several big companies now that want to, to follow this, that want to follow this, yeah. Uh, and to be able to uh, certify such a website or to build such a website that can be certified, you have to have certified persons that know how to make websites accessible. And that's why we implemented the Certified Web Accessibility Experts some years ago. There are more than 50 persons now uh, that, has passed, that have passed this uh, certification in Austria. Uh, but to make it more comparable on an international level, we also try to uh, make the so-called DACH chapter of the International Association of Accessibility Professionals, which was Im implemented in, uh, in the United States. And there are several hundred persons that have passed this exam in the United Nations, in the, in the, in the, in the USA. Uh, and we want to bring it down and to make it, uh, to customize it to European um, uh, needs and, and needs uh, and, 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 and goals. Yeah. So thank you very much for your intention, uh, and I hope it was helpful. Contact me at every time. Thank you very much, Klaus. Well, I want to thank all of our panel members for a very interesting presentations. I'd like to open it 
for any questions or discussions uh, that we might have. And, and uh, one of the privileges of having the chair is I get to ask the first question. And I would like to say, I, I don't think Placencia Pereiro is still with us. No. So I will ask Helga Stevens <laughs> as a member of the parliament. If you remember when uh, Ms. Pereiro was going through her presentation, there was one picture and it said something about a disability card. I don't know what that means, a disability card. I, I am bothered by that. What's a disability card? Uh, is this something the commission is going to propose as legislation to the parliament? Um, because I'm bothered by that because one of the false constructs in all of disability policy is this idea that there's us and them. There are people who are not disabled and there are people who are disabled. That's wrong. You see, disability is a spectrum, not a dividing line, it's a spectrum. And we all fall on that spectrum somewhere. Sometimes we fall one place, sometimes we might fall another place, depending upon illness or accidents or whatever. So this idea of having a disability card to identify someone as being disabled greatly bothers me, and I, so I don't know what the construct of that disability card is. I don't know if our parliamentarian, Helga Stevens, knows about this, but is there any way you could enlighten us as to what this card means? Yes, um, thank you for your question. Uh, the European Union is, uh, Parliament is not fully involved in this um, card. There are a couple of countries like Belgium or uh, other countries. There's a commission, but it's not a uh, card of identity card. Um, it's kind of like a private thing you can apply for. I know, uh, for example, uh, uh, some guy with autism that kind of like uh, says, I, I want to have something that I can show when I go somewhere or, for example, access a museum so that I can ask for help there or have, um, yeah, get help, get benefits, um, get credits for whatever. And so I don't have to kind of like, or with this card I can ask for support or um, yeah, have, have more possibilities if I show my card somewhere. And it helps people where the disability can't be seen if, you, if it's not obvious, for example, while you're like sitting in a wheelchair or so. And there are, in, in Europe there are kind of like amusement parks or um, other, uh, locations you can go to if you uh, show you uh, some of them have said um, if you come alone and you're disabled then you can't get in because it's too dangerous so with this card a second person can come along guard you and uh, doesn't have to pay any any additional money to get into for example the amusement park whatever so the idea is actually It's kind of like the idea of having like an one European passport you can show in every European country you're going to. Um, but at the moment there are still some dif national differences in showing the cards. So that's why the idea is to get one card for the whole European Union. And so, you, and get benefits in every country. But it, um, I, I'm, we're not, we're not, the aim is not to get this card so we only get benefits. That's um, not the main intention. 
but to get equal services in every country. It's not, it's not go and get the card so you get benefits. So it's go and get the card so you get equal services everywhere you go. For example, deaf people can get sound language interpreters wherever they go. Um, or with this card then the other uh, person knows what help I need or what kind of access I need. So it's, um, and it, it tell, the card has icons in back that tells you what kind of disability or what kind of help I need. I'm still bothered by it. <laughs> My brother who was, who was deaf, I can tell you, didn't need a card to demand services. <laughs> he would say, I'm deaf and I want services. He didn't need a card. I, but I, I just, it just, I don't mean to belabor and discuss it any further, but thank you very much. Yes, okay, I, I, got, I got your point. Um, for example, for deaf, it's, if I walk up and use sign language, everybody probably knows I'm deaf. But there are some uh, disabilities where it's not as obvious, where it's not as clear. And for, for example, like autism or whatever. And, um, and some people want to have something with them. They're kind of like tired of explaining and explaining, so uh, they're kind of like, um, some of them said it's easier for them to have something with them, so that's. Thank you. I, I'm sorry to take so much time, but thank you very much, Ms. Stevens. Uh, back here, I first saw a gentleman back here in the beginning, back here, I'm pointing back here. Can you get the mic? Thank you. Uh, I have, uh, thank you very much. I have two questions. The first one is a very specific question to, me, to Helga Stevens. And it is if, uh, if he, she can tell us how many persons with disabilities are in the uh, European Parliament. Because, as also Klaus Lachwitz uh, said, uh, I think that people with disabilities are uh, extremely underrepresented in political institutions. And I wanted to know if that also happens at the level of the European Parliament. And the second question is a little bit more general. I think that uh, we have a long way to go in the protection of the rights of persons with disabilities. And I think that in this, uh, in this moment, there are two crucial issues in every country. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of them is the issue of legal capacity. Uh, the UN Convention requires us to recognize legal capacity of persons with disabilities, and that means uh, substituting old guardianship systems by systems, by models of supported decision making. And the second crucial issue is inclusive education, because also UN Convention requires us to uh, assure that all persons with disabilities go to school with their peers of their same age, and uh, with the uh, supports and resources they need to develop their potential. And these two issues are very important because they, they require a change of paradigm and a change of mentality uh, in ourselves. And uh, I would like to know if some panelists want to answer how, is this, how these two issues are handled in different uh, countries, in the different countries. Thank you very much. Yes, well then I'll go and get to answer your first uh, uh, question. Ah, sorry. Uh, all in all, we're a 750 politician in the European Parliament. And in the 2014 elections, there were six disabled people elected. Two are deaf and four in a wheelchair. And, 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 and one person is kind of like, um, is not, is seeing impaired, so, uh, but they moved, to, this guy moved to Spain, so we're still, we're only five people left, uh, five that I know, I have to say. Maybe there are more disabled people that I can't see, but I, we know, I know, I know we're five.
you ask about equal education? You, you ask about integrated education? Inclusive education and legal capacity, yeah. That was my second question. Well, I'm sure, I'm sure the United States is not the only country. Other countries have integrated in education uh, children with disabilities, with varying disabilities, uh, physical, intellectual, developmental, or combinations thereof. Uh, uh, again, we have to get over the old mindset <laughs> that in a school you have a teacher and you have students. It's been that way for hundreds and thousands of years. Well, maybe we need, yes, a teacher, but maybe we need someone else who is trained to address the special needs of a child who has an intellectual disability or someone who is trained also to respond to the needs of a, of, of a child with uh, developmental disabilities, also in the classroom, also in the classroom. Now, people say, well, that costs money, <laughs> of course. But the fact that these children with intellectual or developmental disabilities are receiving an education alongside their peers, so they're fully integrated, means they won't be ostracized or set apart later in life. They'll be able to obtain employment, to be able to do things later in life. So you, yes, the upfront cost, I understand, is there, but the backside is both economically beneficial to the country or the state in question, not to mention the quality of life for the individual themselves. Hmm? Uh, my question was, because, if, for example, in Spain, there are still uh, more or less 15% uh, of persons with disabilities that are still in special schools, yes. not in the ordinary school system. Someone else had a question. One, one more addition. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Ramon, I'm sorry. I, I, I would like to add one thing. In Israel, um, inclusive education is something that we have been having uh, for, for uh, uh, several years. Um, uh, but, but, you know, it's not enough to state, let's have inclusive education. I'm going back to my point of uh, training, as you mentioned. Uh, just in this past year, uh, we have uh, had new regulations uh, regarding uh, inclusive education, uh, specifically requiring teachers to be trained. Uh, and, and, and I can tell you that before this legislation, we had some uh, uh, pretty, I would say funny, but it's sad, um, uh, examples of teachers that had uh, children with learning disability, hearing disabilities, uh, sight, uh, vision disabilities in the same class, and they had the, the little mic uh, that makes it uh, uh, accessible for hearing impaired, but then the people, the kids with uh, learning disabilities said the echo made it difficult for them to learn, and the teacher didn't get any tools on how to use it. It turns out there's a little button that you have to press and then everything is okay, but making inclusive is not just checking the box. It's doing the training, giving the tools, and making it right. Absolutely, absolutely. I'm sorry, Mr. Rubish. Uh, I can tell you um, something from Austria about the problem of legal capacity. We had in Austria uh, a system of guardianship where uh, persons under full guardianship automatically lost their legal capacity. And when Austria had uh, his, um, its first state examination at the United Nations, this system was very much criticized. Uh, so our Ministry of Justice prepared a reform of this guardianship uh, it was really a long uh, process of reform during several years and uh, that system was replaced by uh, a new system called uh, adult, adult protection law and now it is different. Uh, the persons do not uh, lose their legal capacity. It has to be assessed by a judge uh, in individual way. So I think it, it was a very successful and very good uh, reform. It was a positive point in our national action plan. Uh, but there is one challenge. This is only the one side of the thing. It is the, the legal side, which is in the responsibility of the Ministry of Justice. The other side is 
um, to empower the people to make their own uh, choice, uh, to to make their uh, their own uh, um, their own decisions. Yes, to uh, to make their supported decisions. That means they need support structures, and this costs money and this costs resources. This is a responsibility of the regions, and we don't know how this will work in practice. So this will be the challenge. Mm. But you're doing that. You're moving. You're, we're moving forward. You're moving yeah. forward on that. Well, that's, that's very interesting. Time over. I, I, but this person has to ask one question because she's been trying to get recognized. Right back here. Uh huh. <laughs> here you go. Only one person. Sorry. Yeah, I have a question to Mr. Max Rubich, Emperor Rubich, and. Uh, my question is that you talked about, about the natural action plan and then you said that you are evaluating now the, the action plan, how it works, have worked. And my question is, can you see already some concrete examples of, of how you have implemented the, the rights and, and the changes? Can you already say something about that before the evaluation? Uh, the evaluation will will start, uh, so we are in the process of preparing it. So until now, uh, I cannot say what the result will be. Yeah, we we have to wait uh, to the to, we have to wait for the for the interviews and uh, for the results. I, I, there was one more person that <laughs> I'm told. But I'm, I'm afraid I'm going to get thrown out of here. <laughs> Go I'll ahead. Be yes, short. yes, please, please. Yes. Go ahead. Okay, thank you. Uh, I have a question for Mr. Lachwitz. Uh, you mentioned earlier that uh, there are no people with intellectual disabilities participating in politics. I'm interested. Uh, are you? Were you talking about a specific state or the European U Union, or you were talking globally? Thank you. Well, thank you for that question. Um, well, there are a few countries where everybody can vote, but in the majority of countries, from a global point of view, um, persons with cognitive impairments can't vote still. And even in some countries, you find that deaf people and blind people have problems, at least, to take part in elections. So this study, which was mentioned by me, shows that in eight European countries, for instance, blind people can't take part in elections independently because the structure of the elections does not allow that to just enter the box without any kind of assistance. So I think a lot has to be done to really implement this Article 29. And just to take the chance to say two words about legal capacity, we have made big studies within Inclusion Europe and we came to the conclusion that there are only two countries at the moment who really try to implement Article 12. That's Austria, which was already mentioned, and it's Canada. In Canada, they have so-called micro-boards and these micro-boards try to support the individual with intellectual disability to take chances to speak up, etc., etc. So this is a very good system, but it takes time to teach people and to find coaches and trainers. Thank you. Well, let us thank the panel. This has a great, been a great panel. Thank you all for your attention and for being here, but I'm told we have to leave this room. Thank you very much. <laughs>